Hello, everyone. We are so happy that you joined us on a Tuesday. You know, we're all exhausted by now, but thank you for joining us for this extremely important symposium. This is Mohammed Bitar. I'll be co-moderating the session with my friend and colleague, Dr. Marina Magray. We would like to welcome you to our annual Spondylarthritis Educational Symposium, brought to you by three leading organizations, Spondylarthritis Research and Treatment Network, SPARTAN, Group for Research and Assessment of Psoriasis and Psoriatic Arthritis, GRAPA, and the Assessment of Spondylarthritis International Society, ASAS. We have exciting talks given by experts in the field. We would like to thank our sponsor, UCB, for the educational grant that supported this symposium. We also would like to thank Lisa Spiegel, Annie Spangler, and Judy Pickel for all their efforts on organizing this event. And now we will start with our first speaker. Dr. Clementina Lopez Medina is a rheumatologist and clinical researcher at the Reina Sofia University Hospital and Biomedical Research Institute of Cordoba and Spain. Known for her expertise in spondylarthritis, she has contributed extensively to clinical research and improving the understanding of these conditions. Dr. Lopez Medina's work emphasizes the importance of advancing both patient care and medical knowledge in rheumatology. Dr. Lopez Medina will talk to us about AXPA year in review. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the ASAS Spartan and Grappa Societies for this invitation to review the Axial Spondyl Arthritis Year in Review. Um, I made a search of the manuscript published between November 2023 and October 2024 using the terms Axial Spondyl Arthritis or Ankylosing Spondylitis. I found hundreds of uh, manuscripts, and I selected 15 from this year, so I apologize if you miss any, any manuscript that you like, but this was only a personal selection, and I will try to, to explain to you uh, what I, li I like most from this year. The manuscript can be classified in two main, in four main topics, diagnosis and classification, imaging and radiographic progression, management and comorbidities. Concerning the diagnosis and classification, I would like to show you this manuscript. This published, uh, was published this year from the ASAS group, entitled Goodbye to the Term Ankylosing Spondylitis and Hello to Axial Spondyl Arthritis. This is uh, the main term of the classic term of spondyl arthritis is ankylosing spondylitis, but we know that the spectrum of axial spondyl arthritis is bigger with the inclusion of non-radiographic axial spa, so we need to establish uh, official nomenclature on this, uh, on this uh, topic. Previously, some manuscripts were published, and we found in this systematic literature review that radiographic and non-radiographic axial SPA will share similar characteristics and burden of the disease. And in addition, another manuscript evaluating different cohorts showed that patients fulfilling modified New York criteria also fulfill the ASAS radiographic ASAS criteria. And on the contrary, patients fulfilling the ASAS radiographic axial SPA, among them, the majority also fulfill the modified New York criteria. So based on this data, in 2019, the ASAS group uh, evalu uh, perform a voting during the ASAS meeting to decide some main, uh, main definitions. And they decide that the term axial spondyl arthritis is the overall term for the disease, that the differentiation between radiographic and non-radiographic can be relevant in research, but not specifically for clinical practice, and that the term ankylosing spondylitis and radiographic axial spa can be used interchangeably, but the preferred term is radiographic axial spondyl arthritis. Another manuscript that I would like to show you is this manuscript that evaluates the concept of spondyl arthritis using Latin class analysis. This manuscript was performed in the Registry, which is a Spanish 
registry that includes patients fulfilling the ESSG criteria. This means that the population includes the whole spectrum of spondylar arthritis. Using the Latin class analysis, the authors showed five main phenotypes. The two first phenotypes, the most frequent, showed a typical axial spondylar arthritis with involvement of the sacrilac joints, the spine, and a high prevalence of B27 positivity. The third group includes patients with axial spa, axial involvement and peripheral involvement. This can be identified as a mixed phenotype. And the fourth group includes peripheral involvement and psoriasis and the, with a low prevalence of B27 positivity. This group can be identified as the classic uh, psoriatic arthritis phenotype. And the final group with a lower prevalence of patients showed a phenotype with axial involvement, peripheral involvement, and psoriasis. And authors identified this phenotype as uh, resemble the axial psoriatic arthritis. So this manuscript identified five Latin classes with significant overlaps between axial and peripheral phenotypes in, uh, that is concordant with a unifying concept of spondylar arthritis. Another important manuscript this published this year on the diagnosis of spondylar arthritis in patients with recent chronic back pain. This study was developed in the space cohort that includes patients referred to the rheumatologist because of the suspicions of axial spondylar arthritis. Authors wanted to know whether in patients with less than two years of chronic back pain, it is possible, possible to make the diagnosis with a high level of confidence. They found that at baseline, around 30% of patients can have a definite diagnosis of axial spondylar arthritis, and in 40% of patients, this diagnosis is defi definitively absent. However, there are still around 30% of patients in which, in which it, there is an uncertainty on the diagnosis and this cannot be made with a high level of confidence. The evaluation of these patients after two years show that after two years of follow-up, there is still a 30% of patients in which the diagnosis is unclear and we cannot establish a definite diagnosis with a high level of confidence. So these authors conclude that the diagnosis of a definitive axial spondylar arthritis can be made in nearly one third of patients with chronic back pain, but the uncertainty persists in around 5 to 30% after two years. And they found that repeating MRI may be useful mainly in male patients B27 positive. Concerning the use of the MRI on the diagnosis, this manuscript evaluates the sex differences on the MRI and the performance of the lesions in both sexes for the diagnosis of the axial spondylar arthritis. We know that the anatomy of the sacrilac joints are different between male and female, and this can have implication on the confidence of the diagnosis. Authors evaluated the prevalence of the structural and inflammatory lesions between female and um, males, and they found that ankylosis was more prevalent in males, as well as the uh, fat metaplasia. However, sclerosis was more prevalent in females. The bone marrow edema showed a similar prevalence between male and females. When they evaluated the performance of these lesions for the diagnosis, they found that the performance was more important for the ankylosis and for the fat metaplasia in male patients. However, the performance of bone marrow edema was similar between both sex. So in this analysis, the imaging appearance of axial spondylar arthritis differs between sexes, and we have to take into account that there is a high risk of false positive in women because of the different prevalence of, the, of these lesions. Concerning imaging and radiographic progression, this was the topic with the majority of the manuscript. Many manuscripts have been published this year on this topic. And one important uh, manuscript is the ASAS recommendation for clinical information 
on imaging referrals for suspected axial spondyloarthritis. The ASA Society developed these recommendations in order to establish some um, guide for the information that the rheumatologists should uh, provide to the radiologist when they prescribe an MRI for a patient with suspected axial spondyloarthritis. And the information that the rheumatologist should report to the radiologist are the demographic and relevant clinical data, the history of back pain and the characteristics of this pain, the physical activity or the history of childbirth, previous imaging or previous imaging techniques that the patient was, uh, was evaluated, the, suspic the suspicion of the diagnosis, the reason for the request of the imaging and the possible imaging contraindications. On the other hand, on the radiology journal, other recommendations were published to the radiologist. These rec recommendations include the information that the radiologist should include on the report of the MRI and the information that could be useful for the rheumatologist. And the radiologist should provide the information on the technical data of the, of the MRI, the presence or absence of uh, lesions on the sacrilac joints and spine, the potential uh, relevance of the findings, potential other diagnosis, and also recommendations for further, further imaging. Other recommendations concerning the imaging of the sacrilac joints were published by the uh, collaboration between the ASAS and Spartan groups with the aim to establish the minimum sequences that we need to perform in a patients with suspicious of axial spondyloarthritis and the sequences of the MRI that we need for this diagnosis. These minimum sequences include these four, uh, four techniques. Three sequences are semicoronal and one sequence is axial. On the panel A, you have the semicoronal T1 wave spin echo. This uh, sequence aims to evaluate structural lesions such as sclerosis, fat metaplasia, and also erosions. And the panel C includes the semicoronal T1 wave three-dimensional gradient echo with the aim to evaluate erosions. The other two, panel B and D, are, uh, are focused on the evaluation of bone marrow edema, which means uh, the lesions that refers to the inflammation. This will be the least four sequences that we need to include in the imaging of these patients we, with the aim to optimally visualize inflammation, structural damage, and bone cartilage interface. Another manuscript on the methods for the evaluation of structural damage is this manuscript published in 2024. We know that the radiograph, uh, radiograph uh, and x-ray are the main technique to evaluate structural damage, but we now have other techniques such as low-dose CT and MRI-based synthetic CT. In, the, in this analysis, authors want to validate the MRI-based synthetic CT to determine whether this technique can be useful for detecting, detecting structural damage and structural progression. This is an example of the images that are included on the manuscript. On the right side of the screen, you have the cervical spine, the low-dose CT, which has been used as a gold standard, the MRI synthetic CT, and the radiograph. Authors evaluated the sensitivity and the specificity of this technique in comparison with the gold standard, which is the low dosity. And they found that the sensitivity on the MRI synthetic CT is 0.67 and the specificity 0.96. On the other hand, the radiography showed a sensitivity of 0.1 and specificity of 1. So in conclusion, the authors show that this low-dose CT, uh, that uh, MRI-based synthetic CT, show a very high specificity and a sensitivity much higher than radiography in comparison with the gold standard, which is the low-dose CT. 
So this new technique could be useful for detecting and monitoring structural damage on the axial spondyloarthritis patients. Concerning the radiographic progression in patients with axial spondyloarthritis, these data were published uh, on the DC code to evaluate the switching from non-radiographic to radiographic in patients with axial spondyloarthritis. Previous data on the DC code after five years of follow-up showed that this change is very low. Uh, there is a low probability of changing from non-radiographic to radiographic. And in this occasion, we had the opportunity to evaluate 10 years of follow-up. Using completed patients, which means patients with baseline and 10, 10 year data, completed patients, in this analysis, we found a very low probability of switching from non-radiographic to radiographic, with only around 6% of patients suffered this switching. However, we wanted to evaluate all the patients included in the DC cohort, so we perform a, an integrated analysis, including all the patients that started the cohort at baseline. And we found that uh, around 1% of patients that, that switch from non-radiographic to radiographic per year, which means that after 10 years, the probability of switching was around 10%. However, we wanted also to evaluate whether this change between non-radiographic to radiographic is different in patients under biological demands or without biological demands. And we found that this switching was more important in patients non-treated with TNF blockers. However, in this analysis, we couldn't, um, we couldn't confirm a causal relationship between the use of TNF blockers and the, um, and the prevention of the radiographic progression because the analysis that we made uh, couldn't confirm this, um, this data. An important manuscript published concerning the radiographic progression in patients treated with biological DMARS is this consult trial by uh, the German, their German team who evaluates the use of golimumab plus seclecoxib in comparison with golimumab alone in the inhibition of the structural progression on the spine. Patients were randomized in two arms, golimumab alone and golimumab plus seclecoxib, and patients were followed up during two years to evaluate the change on the MSAS after two years of follow-up. The results of this Clinical trials show that the structural progression of the spine was numerically higher in patients treated with golimumab alone in comparison with golimumab plus selecoxib. However, these uh, differences were non-significant. Similarly, the proportion of patients that develop a new syndesmophyte was more prevalent in patients treated with golimumab alone but again, the differences were non-significant. So the study failed to demonstrate a superiority to the, of the combination therapy in the retardation of the structural damage, but numerically, with the authors found some differences. Another important trial on the structural progression is the SURPASS study, the first, first head-to-head -head study in patients with axial spondyloarthritis that evaluates sicokinumab versus adalimumab, and the main objective is the evaluation of the structural progression. Patients were randomized in two groups, sicokinumab 150, sicokinumab 300, and uh, adalimumab for 40 milligram. After two years of follow-up, the change on the MSAS was similar across the three groups. So the study did not demonstrate a superiority of segukinumab in comparison with alalimumab on the retardation of the structural progression. However, the three groups showed um, uh, an important improvement of the clinical symptoms in this patient. Concerning the management section, I would like to show you this manuscript published this year, a phase two trial, a pilot study to evaluate Namilumab, a granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor inhibitor. This drug has been demonstrated 
to be efficacy in mirroring, mirroring models of ankylosing spondylitis. And in this trial, they test the efficacy on human patients with axial spondyloarthritis. This cytokine is implicated in different pathways, maturation of dendritic cell and other, other pathways. And uh, the, the study did not show significant differences for ASAS-20 between the placebo group and the active group. The studies uh, included not too much patient because this was a pilot study and they used a Bayesian analysis, but the study failed to, to demonstrate superiority of this drug in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. Another important topic is the difficult to treat axial spondyloarthritis. You know that the ASAS group is uh, conducting an initiative to define this type of patients. However, we have data on registry, national registries. In this case, the French, a French group evaluated on their national data of insurance this definition of difficult to treat axial spondyloarthritis. They consider these patients as those that failure of three biological or targeted synthetic DMARs or two biological or two targeted synthetic DMARs with different modes of action. They evaluated 22,000 of patients, and among them, they found that 47% received at least one biological or targeted systemic, systemic, uh, synthetic demands. Among patients that received at least one treatment, 19% were classified as difficult to treat, according to the previous definition that I mentioned. Then they evaluated the factors associated with this definition, and they found that female sex, psoriasis, hypertension, and depression were associated to be difficult to treat in patients with axial spondyl arthritis. Then they evaluated if this definition was associated with an increased risk of major cardiovascular events, and they found no differences after six years of follow-up between difficult to treat patients and non-difficult to treat patients. And the last section concerning the comorbidities, I would like to show you this manuscript published this year on claim data from South Korea. They used the definition of uh, ankylosing spondylitis as the code, and they evaluated whether the use of high dose versus low dose of NSAIDs was associated with an increase on the cardiovascular events. They defined patients we treated with high dose as uh, more than 0.5 defined daily dose, which means the more than a half of the standard treatment, daily standard treatment of NSAIDs, and low dose as an exposure of less than 0.5 defined daily dose. After adjusting the models for different confounders, they found that after 10 years of follow-up, the risk of uh, or the incidence of cardiovascular disease, ischemic heart disease, stroke, and congestive health failure, this incidence was more important in patients with high dose of exposure versus low dose. However, a few weeks later, some colleagues sent and published this correspondence on this, uh, on this manuscript stating that uh, with claim data, it is difficult to establish a true causal relationship between NSAIDs and, and, and cardiovascular events, so we need to interpret the data with caution. Concerning the bone mineral density, we know that uh, TNF blockers use is, can be associated with uh, improvement on bone mineral density. However, we didn't have long-term data on this topic. In this analysis, authors evaluated eight years of uh, follow-up in patients treated with anti-TNF, and they found that an increase on the bone mineral density at the lumbar spine and on the hip after eight years of follow-up. However, 16% of patients develop new vertebral fractures despite this improvement of the bone mineral density. So they, the authors claim to 
uh, have to pay attention to trabecular bone loss in daily practice because this, despite the improvement of bone mineral density, patients can still have vertebral fractures. And the last manuscript evaluates the myelinating disease. You know that this is a very uncommon adverse event, but we have to take into account this, uh, this topic on patients treated with TNF blockers. And authors evaluate in a prospective data of 30 years the incidence of the myelinating disease. They found that the incidence in patients with axial spondyl arthritis is more important in comparison with psoriatic arthritis. And then when they evaluate the factors associated with this demyelinating disease, they found that the diagnosis of axial spondyl arthritis, smoking, and IBD were significantly associated with this incidence. However, and interestingly, the use of TNF blockers in this analysis did not show significant difference for the development of this, uh, this uh, demyelinating disease. And this was my selection. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Is it working? Yeah. No. Uh, Thank you so much for this uh, very nice review uh, of all the uh, articles, very high impact articles over the past year. Now we have a few minutes for Q and A. If anyone has any questions, Matt. Hi, Matthew. Still a very interesting talk. For the support study, did you look at outcomes such as uh, resolution of bone marrow edema or symptoms preparing the two medicines? I didn't. Uh, do you mean the the study about sex differences between on the? No, the uh, comparison between secukinumab and adalimumab when you look oh. at radiographic outcomes. Do you look at? improvement in symptoms and bone marrow edema between the two medicines? Yeah, in, in both groups, the symptoms were improved at the, at the same level and also the bone marrow edema. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, I have a question uh, about the study. That, uh, as you mentioned, there is a lot of studies over the past year about sacroiliac radiographic progression. Yeah. And I see that this study you were a co-author yeah. on. So um, have you studied the correlation between the sacroiliac radiographic progression with spinal progression and with function or physical function? Because we get this question a lot, okay, we repeat x-rays in a few years, we see a little, one or two erosions in the SI joint. Patients are doing well, physical function is intact. What do we do with this? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. In this analysis, we only focus on, on the sacroiliac joint but now in the desert core, there is a, 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 an ancillary analysis evaluating the association between the sacroiliac joint involvement and the posterior, the, 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 the development of uh, spinal progression. And definitely we need to know if uh, how the prediction of the spinal progression depending on the sacroiliac joint involvement. So, uh, yes, they w there is also a hypothesis that the, that the structural progression start at the sacroiliac joint and then come up to the, but we, we are not, uh, this is not true, very clear, so there is now, we are analyzing this, this data to evaluate how we can predict you know, the spinal progression. So the study, that uh, space cohort study, which looked at patients who had two years of back pain and were mm -hmm. referred, about 30% of patients who shed did, still did not have diagnosis at the end of two years. Were there any predictors in the study that helped us to see that, you know, would make, enable us to make the diagnosis? Yeah, the two main prediction, predictors were the fact of being male sex, B27 positive and MRI positive, uh, and no, no MRI, B male, uh, female, uh, male sex and B27 positive are the main predictors. In these patients, we make it, we have to pay attention because these are the profile of patients that have more probabilities for the developing, the development of the disease. So in these patients, it is useful to make MRIs, frequent MRIs, or so one per year more or less to evaluate after two years if they they performed, they made the, the diagnosis after two years. Thank you. I don't think we have any questions. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs>
sorry. Congratulations for your presentation. Thank you. Just a, a question about the last uh, paper. How in your um, in your practice do you evaluate osteoporosis in this particular patient because the seamless bobbits and there? <laughs> And which is the treatment of choice for this one? Thank you. In our clinical practice, we, in patients with bamboo spine or important structural damage, we don't perform a spine evaluation because of the, we know that the bone mineral density cannot be useful in this case, only hip uh, involvement. Um, we treat, we evaluate the patients and we try to focus on the bone mineral density mainly in patients with long-standing disease, in patients in, in male patients and also female patients with long-standing disease with some um, factors, predictive factors of osteoporosis. Yeah, FRAX it can be one of the, uh, on these uh, tools here. Yeah. The treatment as in clinical practice for other patients with osteoporosis, not, uh, we don't make any special difference in comparison with typical osteoporosis patients. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. And now our next uh, speaker is Dr. Shika Singla, who serves as an assistant professor of medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin where she serves as the medical director of the psoriatic arthritis program. Dr. Singla aims to improve the quality of life of patients through patient-centered studies. Dr. Singla will talk about psoriatic arthritis here in review. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to present today. It's indeed a privilege and pleasure to discuss the year in review. Here are my disclosures. In preparation for today's talk, I searched PubMed using the term psoriatic arthritis. I included filters uh, for full text studies conducted in humans in English language from November 1st, 2023 to October 31st of this year. I also searched ULAR 2024 abstracts. Uh, I classified my articles into these uh, different topics and will try to present a couple of studies about each of these uh, themes. Starting from therapeutics, I'll first address the elephant in the room. Bimekizumab just got approved in United States for psoriatic arthritis less than two months ago. Um, in the absence of head-to-head -head trials, they conducted a systemic literature review and NMA where they compared 12 to 24 week efficacy outcomes for biologic or targeted synthetic DMAR naive, I'll just call them bio naive, and TNF experienced patients. They analyzed ACR 20, 50, 70, PASI 90, 100, and MDA, and assessed 41 uh, th randomized controlled trials for 22 DMARDs. And um, they used various models and, uh, and looked at the best fit model to calculate the probability of vimekizumab, 160 milligram every four weeks, being better than other treatments by using Sucra to determine relative rank. For bio patients, vimekizumab ranked fifth for ACR 50 and third for ACR 70. For TNF experienced patients, it ranked second for ACR 50 and first for ACR 70. For MDAs, it ranked first for both bio-naive and um, TNF experienced patients. And severe adverse events were also comparable. So the take home message is that it did show favorable relative efficacy and safety, but remember this is just indirect treatment comparison and not a substitute for head to head trial. As all the trials uh, the reported outcomes not at the same time, and there was some heterogeneity regarding TNF experienced patients. Uh, some patients had an inadequate response and others discontinued due to other reasons such as loss uh, of access. They also conducted 
matching adjusted indirect comparisons, and I will not go over all these studies, but in these studies, they use propensity score matching to reweight individual patient data on the basis of summary baseline characteristics to adjust for the differences. And they calculated likelihood of ACR 20, 50, 70, and MDA responses at 52 weeks for both biologic naive and TNF inadequate responders. These studies had their limitations. There was a lot of unobserved or unreported variables that were not possible to control at baseline. And uh, there were some variations in study designs as well. Moving on to the foremost trial, uh, we heard about this trial at last year's ACR, but it was published this year. This is a phase four multi-center randomized control trial of oligoarticular PSA patients that they defined as swollen or tender joint count of more than one, but less than equal to four. They randomized the patients two is to one to a Pramilas 30 milligram BID or placebo for 24 weeks with an early escape at week 16. The primary endpoint was modification of MDA mandating one or less swollen or tender joint count. Uh, they enrolled 308 patients. The mean PSA duration was close to 10 months, and about 40% of these patients were on conventional synthetic DMARDs. Um, and as you can see in the figure, for um, MDA joints, both in sentinel joints and in all joints, the uh, uh, primulas did significantly better than placebo. They also looked at proportion of patients who progressed to active joint count of more than four, and again, Apramilas did better than placebo, and also in most of the um, secondary outcomes. So the take-home message is that Apramilas is effective um, for patients with early PSA and limited joint involvement, but these results may not be applicable to late or bio-experienced patients. Next, I've chosen a very uh, uh, controversial topic of uh, comparison of uh, biologic monotherapy versus a uh, combination with methotrexate. This was a prospective longitudinal observational multicenter study conducted in Germany of axial spondyloarthritis patient or psoriatic arthritis patients, which were diagnosed by their treating rheumatologists. Um, who initiated new treatment. They collected data at three months, six months, and then every six months. And um, the baseline characteristics are on your right, uh, but I've summarized on the left side uh, that 70% uh, of their patients uh, started uh, biologic DMARDs as monotherapy and about 30% on combination therapy. And they found no significant difference in disease activity outcomes or patient reported outcomes, but there was a difference between satisfaction concerning tolerability of previous treatment, and this was more in combination therapy. Drug retention was also the same in both cohorts. The take-home message here is that methotrexate appears to have a little influence on drug retention rates, uh, and there may be significant role of patient satisfaction and drug tolerability in treatment decisions uh, for PSA. But this study had some limitations, uh, confounding by indication, and there was no data available regarding anti-drug antibodies. Next is gender differences. There were a lot of studies uh, regarding this topic. The first one that I've included is real-world data from PSA Bio, which is a prospective observational cohort study from Europe of a PSA patient starting use tekinimab or TNF inhibitor. This is a post hoc analysis where they compared gender-related differences regarding persistence, disease activity, and patient-reported outcomes, as well as safety. Uh, they collected data at baseline, then every six months up to three years. I've summarized on your left, at baseline, they found that females had higher first scores, more polyarticular disease and enthesitis, more axial involvement combined with peripheral joints, um, and more comorbidities and received more antidepressants and analgesics. On the other hand, males had more oligoarticular disease, dactylitis, and more psoriasis, and received NSAIDs and steroids. 
there were significantly more males who received ustekinimab or TNF inhibitors as their first-line biologics than females. Regarding outcomes, at baseline, females had higher CDAPSA, higher HAC scores, and PSET scores, and they also looked at 12-month data and found that females had uh, lesser low disease activity, lesser MDA, but they continue to have higher HAC and PSET scores. The proportion of the patients who reached targets were also significantly more in males in most of these um, data, and treatment persistence was also more in males. So the question is why these differences? Maybe the sex hormones are contributing to enhanced immunogenicity and uh, pro-inflammatory disease. Maybe enthesitis and polyarticular disease are a way in which females express their pain. It may be linked to the higher levels of fibromyalgia and chronic pain seen in females. Um, next study is a retrospective analysis, also in Europe, of patients receiving first TNF treatment and uh, who were diagnosed by the treating rheumatologist. They were evaluated by DAS-28 CRP low disease activity, and data was collected at 6, 12, and 24 months. They adjusted both cohorts for age, country, conventional synthetic DMARDs, and TNF start year. They had different cohorts that I won't go over. Um, but regarding their outcomes, in their primary cohort, the probability of having DAS-28 CRP low disease activity at six months was significantly more in males than females. And there was 18% lower probability for women to have LDA compared to men. And the results were quite similar in most of their outcomes. Retention rates were also more in males than females in most of the countries. Again, the question is why these differences. Um, are androgens and progesterones have an immunosuppressive action? Are hormones affecting the gut microbiota, which is involved in pathogenesis of PSA? Uh, maybe the lower persistence of TNA treatment in females is due to different in pharmacokinetics. Maybe higher TNF concentrations in women um, are causing these increased adverse events, leading to discontinuation of the medication. Um, the study had limitations. They looked at just DAS-28, and they lacked data regarding core domains, and there could be some selection bias due to multiple cohorts. But this is real-world data, and uh, it involved a highly diverse patient population representing a significant portion of Europe. Uh, the last study, which uh, Dr. Lee Hedder also presented at the session, if you've not seen it, please see that session, um, this is the randomized control trials in adults uh, PSAs that uh, assess the efficacy of targeted advanced therapies versus placebo or another DMARD. And they looked at 54 trials for their uh, literature review. And they found only nine uh, uh, studies with baseline characteristics by sex. 18 had efficacy endpoints by sex, and only two had safety endpoints by sex. Again, very similar results. Males were younger, had lesser BMI, lesser hack, sco uh, lesser hack scores, pain scores, and physician and patient global assessments, as well as enthesitis. But they had higher psoriasis, CRP, and dactylitis. For all drug classes, the probability of ACR20 in males was significantly more than females, but not for JAK and TIC2. The take-home message here is that biological sex of PSA patients influences their response to advanced therapies, but the effect varies by drug class. With limitation of the studies, there was some selective reporting. Uh, but future trials do need to include these baseline characteristics and endpoint results by sex so that we can understand these gender-based differences better. Next, I have biomarkers. The first study that I've selected is regarding prediction of psoriatic arthritis in psoriasis patients. The aim was to identify DNA methylation markers that can we predict which patients with psoriasis will develop psoriatic arthritis before the onset of MSK symptoms. They measured the whole blood DNA methylation profiles and calculated per predictive performance by using support vector machine. And uh, they divided the cohorts into converters, patients who develop arthritis, and matched non-converters. 
and they found that in uh, for majority of markers there was just 10 per, less than 10 percent change in methylase, methylation and there was 630 significantly different methylated positions across 431 genes um, it involves close to 300 pathways and the top 10 enriched pathways are listed on the figure and they found 36 methylation markers across 15 genes um, on the figure on your right. And these uh, one-fourth of these markers were located on the gene FBX027 and ZNF385D. So DNA methylation markers may be able to stratify our new patients with psoriasis as potential patients to develop psoriatic arthritis. But the limitation of the study was that samples were stored over years and separating specific population or measuring gene expression levels was not possible. Next, also another study from Toronto cohort regarding flares of psoriatic arthritis. Um, it is understood that during flares, there is tissue turnover. Uh, MMPs can cleave uh, extracellular matrix and, in, and inflammatory components. So the objective here was to evaluate the proteolytic markers in serum and synovial fluid of PSA patients. In this serum, they included 30 PSA patients and close to 100 uh, controls and um, non-flare patients. In their synovial fluid um, samples, they include 57 patients with flares and 54 with OA patients. They defined their flare as at least one swollen joint count or tender joint count requiring joint aspiration or intra-articular steroid injection for acute onset of pain. And in this serum, they found collagen biomarkers, fibrotic markers, and some inflammatory biomarkers to be elevated in flare patients. And in synovial fluid, um, they found a macrophage activity marker to be elevated as compared to osteoarthritis. The discriminatory performance was um, good for PSA patients compared to PSA without flares for these five markers. Um, and the take-home message here is that they reflect synovitis, anthocytis, neutrophilic activity, and may serve as novel tool for quantitatively monitoring flares in PSA patients. The limitation of the study is uh, that it's a cross-sectional design, and we, there is a need for longitudinal studies to validate these results. Next, I have difficult to treat psoriatic arthritis. Uh, this first study I've included is from France. This was a retrospective analysis of a tertiary center in France. The patients were identified by ICD-10 codes and assessed for baseline characteristics of difficult-to-treat PSA. Um, biologic DMADs were prescribed to these patients according to ULAR and French uh, Rheumatology Society guidelines, and they defined difficult-to-treat PSA as two or more than two um, biologic art targeted synthetic DMART failure with different mechanism of action, and they took this definition from uh, rheumatoid arthritis definition from ULAR. They also defined very difficult to treat psoriatic arthritis by failure of two or more uh, biologic DMARDs for more than two years, and they compared it to non difficult to treat PSA. Um, and they assessed 150 patients and found that axial involvement, axial um, with peripheral structural damage, and biologic DMA discontinuation due to poor dermatological control to be significant between the two groups, but uh, the comorbidities were not significant. Um, they also included 17 PSA patients with very difficult to treat PSA and found obesity and axial involvement to be more in these patients. In their multivariable analysis, um, they found some predictive factors for difficult to treat PSA as listed. So the take home message here is the definition proposed by EULA Task Force for RA does not meet the satisfaction for PSA, and there is a need for better characterization of difficult to treat PSA. The limitation of this study was uh, there was some missing data, and in, in, there was incomplete follow-up as well, and the cohort was very limited in size, and they did not evaluate social and economic status of the patients. 
So we at Grappa, we uh, took the initiative to send out um, healthcare professionals some surveys, and we received more than 200 responses, and uh, the maximum response was from Europe, and they were about 80% rheumatologists and about 20% dermatologists. And we found that there was a consensus among more than 80% of respondents regarding advocacy of two different definitions. One is difficult to treat with active disease, and the other is complex to manage, where non-inflammatory factors that contribute to ineffectiveness of treatment will, um, will also be included. And regarding number of treatment failure, there was a lot of heterogeneity. And... Um, Less than 50% included more than one conventional synthetic DMOD along with two biologic uh, or targeted synthetic DMODs with different modes of action. Uh, but we heard from Dr. Proft on, uh, for the GRAPA meeting that we are going to get a definition for difficult to treat psoriatic arthritis um, in, in 2025. Moving on to machine learning, um, this is a proof of concept study. Um, which is regarding uh, development and validation of SORCAST app, uh, which is a sensor-based smartphone assessments of participants who have psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis and compared them to healthy controls. They calculated concordance and accuracy of clinical assessments and digital assessments on the same day. I will just focus on MSK part, not the skin part. Um, about... Uh, Three quarter of their patients had psoriatic arthritis. For painful joint count, they asked the patients to tap on their joints and the concordance was low. For digital jar opening, they used the full arm rotation and found um, area under ROC as 0.68. Their 30-second walk test did not observe significant discriminatory capacity for lower um, extremity involvement, but the, sins, the skin scores looked very good. So the takeaway points are that this app may be valuable for early PSA or functional assessment over time, but may not be as useful for pre-existing damage and OA in our, because the joints are already impaired. And um, we need validation in larger cohorts. Last, I have guidelines. I'll just quickly summarize what uh, National Psoriasis Foundation recommended for vaccination. Uh, we know about... Um, uh, non-live vaccines, but for live vaccines, they recommended to DC tofacitinib, methotrexate, docravacitinib before and after the vaccine, but DC cyclosporin um, and just after vaccine and continue pramilast and acetretin uh, during, uh, uh, while uh, even after receiving the live vaccine. And they recommended to discontinue most biologics before and after live vaccines. I really like this table in which they mention all half-lives, and they recommended to uh, hold medications for at least one half-life before and two to four weeks after. All right, next is um, pre uh, perioperative guidelines, uh, uh, same recommended by National Psoriasis Foundation. Um, for low-risk surgeries, there was sufficient evidence to continue TNF, abatacept, methotrexate, and cyclosporin. Per their expert opinion, continue apramilast, IL-17, IL-23, and eustachinumab. For intermediate risk or high-risk surgeries, continue methotrexate, cyclosporin, apramilast, abatacept, IL-17 and 23, and 12-23 but they recommended conservative case-by-case -case approach and whole TNF for one full dosing interval before um, total knee or hip arthroplasty. And there was insufficient evidence for tofacitinib, aparacitinib, and ducravacitinib. And the last slide is about PALNA recommendations about treatment of psoriatic arthritis. I'll just summarize the differences between PALNA and GRAPA and ULAR. Um, the domains um, that were recommended to manage by rheumatologists were just enthesitis, dactylitis, and axial disease, unlike GRAPA, where they've included uveitis, IBD, psoriasis, and nails as well. Um, and they did not include sulfasalazine. There was uh, conditional recommendations for imaging, uh, but GRAPA has not recommended any imaging for the patients. But there were strong recommendations regarding monotherapy. And we know that ULAR has recommended uh, combination therapy with methotrexate. Again, a very controversial topic. Um, and they defined a time frame of one year to determine a remission before tapering. 
but EULAR and GRAPA have not. And they also recommended imaging for follow-up and EULAR does not. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Laura Gossett, who is a professor of rheumatology at Sorbonne University. You know, she's a distinct leader in rheumatology and has internationally been acclaimed for her groundbreaking work on patient-centered care, disease activity measures, and outcome in rheumatic diseases. Her contributions have redefined how we approach chronic inflammatory conditions, ensuring that patients' perspective remains central to the care. Thank you so much for talking today. Well, thank you so much for this, uh, my gosh, pretty uh, stressful introduction, but thank you so much. Um, Hello, everyone, and I know it's the end of the ACR Congress, but it's not yet the end of our symposium, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you some uh, some cases. So it's going to be really interesting because with Leanne, we're doing uh, difficult cases for PSA, then for AXPA, but we took uh, quite different approaches, I think, so you won't see any duplication there. So... I was asked to discuss challenging cases, and then it's difficult to know what types of cases I want to discuss. There are many challenging cases in uh, the way we deal with our patients, but I chose two cases that I want to share with you. And these are my disclosures of interest, and I'd like to thank very much uh, Grappa Spartan and Asas for inviting me today. So this is a patient I saw a couple of years ago. She's a woman whose job is secretary. There are still secretaries in France. I don't know about your country. Um, She's obese. For us in France, 29 is pretty pretty high. Um, And she's had uh, longstanding confirmed psoriasis, but it's quite quite limited, mainly uh, now behind the ears. And... um, uh, I don't, this is the first time I see her, so uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, She has pain in her left wrist, she's left-handed, and she's got pain both during the day, in particular when she's typing, but she says she also has pain at night. She doesn't have any other pain in other joints. She says it feels a bit stiff in the morning, maybe 20 minutes. Uh, She's not too clear about that. And when I examine her, I don't find any synovitis or tenosynovitis. So this is a patient with definite psoriasis. She comes of herself because she's seen me on the internet. She uh, didn't uh, see any other rheumatologist, and she didn't really discuss this with her general practitioner. Um, Her pain is at three, um, and I did not assess fatigue and patient global. Um, I, I don't know what you do, but when I have a patient who doesn't have definite disease, I don't go and look at fatigue specifically. And again, I didn't have any swollen joint, but I did have a tender joint of one and very limited skid psoriasis, as I said. So what would you do for her? Because we have this patient, she's quite young, she's got pain in her wrist. And of course, she's coming to me because she knows I do psoriatic arthritis. So, you know, should we do x-rays? Should we do CRP? Should we do ultrasound? Should we perhaps just start treating and see what happens? Because her pain is at three. She doesn't have any swollen joints. Maybe start physiotherapy. I don't know what you would do in this case. I would explore more because I'm worried that she may have PSA. So I did do x-rays. They were normal. I did do a CRP. It was negative. And I did do ultrasound because my center is, we have very easy access to uh, joint and endothelial ultrasound. So I did uh, do ultrasound and there was nothing there. So I don't know if you would think this is still worrying. But for my part, I concluded that this was mechanical pain. I didn't have any arguments to push towards PSA, I felt. So I give her NSAIDs. I also gave her um, topical NSAIDs and a wrist orthosis. And I told her, you know, she was typing too much and she should get a little gel support for her, uh, for her wrist. Um, In France, we're very big on prevention of uh, MSK pain at work. So she can get that for free. And uh, uh, so I thought I would never see her again. And I said, you know, everything is fine. So, Should I have worried more? I'm going to show you I probably should have worried more. (laughs) But, um, you know, even when patients have uh, longstanding PSO, we know they can develop uh, PSA, and we know it is around 30% of the patients. But, again, she had quite limited skin psoriasis, but 
basically you can never be perfectly sure your patient won't get anything right and this there's this huge concept nowadays of interception uh, of uh, PSA which is really catching these patients before they get into PSA but this is mainly for research, right? And um, I really like this review paper by uh, Clementina, who spoke a few minutes ago, about looking, comparing the different ways the different expert groups have um, addressed this concept of moving in the continuum from PSO to PSA and the idea that we should be intercepting disease, preventing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the appearance of PSA in this sort of middling phase you see here. And this, I think, is mainly useful for our derm colleagues because then they should probably be considering using drugs which are efficacious for both skin uh, psoriasis and PSA. And we do have quite a few uh, drugs, including the biologic and targeted drugs that I'm showing you here. So actually, was my patient already transitioning from PSO to PSA at this moment when I saw her? Um, I'd like to refer you to the recently published um, ULAR points to consider for the transition from PSO to PSA. And in this case, we would uh, ULAR would recommend to see these three phases, patients at higher risk, and those correspond to the pinky sort of uh, uh, four uh, elements that we have here. She did not have nail involvement. She was... Uh, she did have obesity. She uh, did not have psoriasis severity. She did not have a family history of PSA. And then the subclinical phase with joint pain uh, and or imaging evidence. She had joint pain. She had no imaging evidence, right? So she was somewhere in between. And even on these risk factors, not everyone fully agrees. You can see here, again, this nice overview by uh, Clementina of the risk factors for the different groups, and not everyone fully agrees on the risk factors. But basically, she had very few risk factors, but she did have joint pain. And that's where, where you know, maybe... Maybe that's why I think this case is challenging because she really comes with a mechanical presentation, I feel, to me, but um, maybe I should have done more. <laughs> Just showing you the points to consider here, some of the selected points to consider. Arthralgia in P patients with PSO should be considered as a risk factor for PSA development, but taking into account alternative diagnosis, which is what I did, and imaging could be used, and I did use imaging here. And really, the idea here is for trials, but again, this is more for research. We should be targeting patients with a combination of symptoms and imaging abnormalities, which she didn't have imaging abnormalities. Okay, she sends me an email six months later. She says she still has pain, but now she has pain also in her uh, second uh, metacarpal phalangeal joint. Um, so I see her again in clinic, and now her pain is at five. Morning stiffness is now at 30 minutes. I put fatigue at four and patient global at five with question marks because um, I feel my patients have difficulty answering these questions when it's the first times I see them because they don't really understand exactly what I'm getting at with this pain. I think is pretty universal, and um, most patients don't have a lot of difficulty, but the other patient-reported outcomes are a bit more difficult. And now I did have a swollen joint, the two tender joints I referred to, and still limited skin psoriasis. So I think she probably has synovitis of her wrist at that moment, um, she's got sort of, I would say, bigger wrists. I don't know. Some people just do. <laughs> um, but the ultrasound did confirm um, two synovitis, both with power Doppler. Uh, CRP is just at the limit, 8 milligram per liter. I did not repeat the x-ray. It had only been a, f a few months. And so I then told her that she now had early oligoarticular PSA. Uh, I think you would probably agree with me. She's got two synovitis confirmed by ultrasound, um, you know, she's she's one of the unlucky ones, let's say, and she's moved into that. So is this typical for early PSA? Well, if we look at the literature review um, performed by um, Gabriele DeMarco, uh, indeed, uh, most patients who start PSA moving, transitioning from PSO, they do have peripheral forms, and they very often are oligoarticular. You can see at the bottom of the slide the the range of means for painful and swollen joint count. So, um, yeah, she would be pretty usual for very early PSA. Okay, 
what would you do then? So I had to take some time and explain to her that she now had moved into PSA, feeling a bit bad, I have to say, about maybe having, maybe, I don't know, under-treated her the first time, but these are challenging cases, right, which I'm sharing with you. Um, what would you do? Start methotrexate, start leflunomide, start maybe a TNF inhibitor. She's young, you know, um, or do joint injections and no DMARD. She's only got two joints. It's really oligoarticular. Um, well, I decided to treat her with methotrexate. Uh, that would be my usual uh, treatment, but that's what I decided for her. I started her at 25 milligram, which uh, was the normal dose for her given her weight. I used it subcute, and I also gave symptomatic treatment. Of course, we have a lot of choice now. So, you know, on top of the conventional synthetic DMARDs, we have these uh, six different modes of action for the biologics and the two different modes of action for the targeted synthetic drugs. So, you know, was I right to start methotrexate for her? Should we have done something else? I'm prepared this slide for you guys, <laughs> showing you the three recommendations uh, side by side for patients with peripheral arthritis and the ACR recommendations I won't really go into. Their process was a bit complex, but the grappa are very easy to understand and I like them a lot. Um, and they would say you can basically choose as you want. And so I did follow the grappa guidelines. I used a conventional synthetic DMARC. The EULA recommendations have now uh, individualized oligoarticular from polyarticular, and she would actually be in the oligoarticular with poor prognostic factors because of her CRP. Uh, at the time I saw her, I didn't really have that in mind anyway, but I wanted to start a conventional synthetic DMARD for her, which I did. So I, I, I also followed uh, unwittingly those guidelines, let's say. Um, and why methotrexate? Well, maybe you would have chosen leflunomide or indeed sofosalazine, but... Um, I think methotrexate is the mainstay for me in patients with early PSA. It is used a lot, uh, although we don't have a lot of randomized controlled trial data. And then the very nice controlled trial did indicate some efficacy last year. I think, I don't know, many, some, maybe some of you would have started with a biologic, but I started her on methotrexate. And then I did see her again a few weeks ago. She was still, I did see her in between, by the way, but then I saw her a few weeks ago and she was still on methotrexate. I do sort of wonder if she's taking it absolutely regularly. Um, she says she is, but I, I don't know. Sometimes you get this feeling with patients that they may not be taking it very regularly. And unfortunately, when I examine her, I find her wrist is painful, but not swollen. But I think it looks a bit strange. The form that doesn't look like it did a year ago. So I did do a repeat x-ray, um, which for us is very easy. I get it in a, a few minutes in my hospital, like maybe half an hour. So she did get an x-ray and now she's got joint space narrowing of the same left wrist, which is the problem for her from the start. So then I feel really bad. <laughs> um, the assessment is she has some pain, some fatigue. Um, she doesn't have morning stiffness. She's only got pain in this single joint, which is the, the, the wrist, and um, it's not swollen. She still has very little psoriasis and uh, no endocytis. So I have a CRP, which uh, she's getting as follow-up for her methotrexate with a liver um, function and so on, which is normal. And so I do get ultrasound also, which is normal for her. So there's no synovitis on the ultrasound. So what would you do now? Because she's progressed from a structural point of view, but she actually has no inflammation as I see her today. She, she, you know, she doesn't have any inflammation. I decided not to change the disease-modifying treatment, but to um, address with her the importance of treatment adherence because I do have some doubts about that. So again, a challenging case for me. I do feel really sorry for this patient. I feel a lot of empathy for her. Um, as one does with patients, and I feel it's, you know, she destroyed her wrist on my watch, so I feel very bad about that. I think, you know, sometimes people do progress quite quickly when they have PSA, and this was rapid progression. I did have baseline x-rays, which were strictly normal. Um, we should keep in mind the prognostic factors here, but she didn't really have poor prognostic factors, except the CRP, which was 
just limit abnormal once and then always normal. And she didn't have any of the other risk factors. So that ends my first case that I wanted to discuss with you. But I think, you know, the key messages, the key take-home messages to make this useful for you guys is that preclinical PSA should indeed be very cl closely monitored. Um, and maybe, you know, I should have, I don't know, repeated the ultrasound or something for her. Um, an oligoarticular PSA can be severe. It can lead to radiographic progression. I think it's not absolutely clear what should have been the first-line treatment in her case. I don't actually regret not using a biologic, but maybe some of you will discuss that later with me and you would have done that. But she had limited inflammation and treatment adherence, of course, can be an issue. And I think that's why she progressed also. Just as I said, we're still lacking biomarkers for rapid radiographic progression in these patients. I also have experienced that some of them just stay with only one or two joints. Moving on to my second case, this is also a, a woman. She's aged 56. She's got a peripheral form of PSA with very limited skin psoriasis, and she's already receiving a biologic, adalimumab and methotrexate, as co-medication, as well as symptomatic treatment. She actually was transferred to me from another city in, in France, so a colleague asked me to take her on, and uh, she was already receiving this adalimumab um, and methotrexate. And um, she tells me that she's got more pain than usual, in particular in her knees, but also, and this, you know, this is one of our challenges, it's quite difficult to know where she has pain. She has pain, I would say, not ex exactly everywhere, but in places which are not exactly joints either. And there is no clear um, exact timing in the day, and she also says she's tired, but actually at that moment in time when I see her, she's not so tired, but she's got pain, quite a bit of pain. Um, and CRP is negative. So if we look at her uh, status, she's got a pain of five, no morning stiffness, um, or at least no very clear morning stiffness. Again, she said she had pain all the time. Fatigue was quite high. Patient global was quite high. I have no swollen joints, two tender joints, limited skin, but I have pain on enthesis. Now, um, I don't think Daphne is in the room, but she would tell us that it's very easy to distinguish pain on enthesis from pain outside of enthesis, but for me, I don't find it so easy when pain, patients have a lot of pain a bit everywhere. <laughs> but anyway, the leads is at four, um, so that's where we are for her. So she's got this pain, including some joints, but also some enthesis. I don't see any swollen joints. She's fatigued. CRP is normal. Clinical examination is pretty reassuring. I don't know, would you repeat the CRP? Would you do a joint ultrasound, an anthesial ultrasound? Maybe you would do an MRI, I don't know. Would you change treatment for her? Don't know what you would do. <laughs> I would explore more before I change treatment because I don't have signs of active inflammation. So um, I, I did redo a CRP because the one she brought me was from a month ago. And well, sometimes it changes a bit. I did do ultrasound, as I told you. It's quite um, nice for me because I have easy access to ultrasound. So of the joints, there was nothing, no synovitis. But on the enthesis, there was one enthesitis, but it was quite limited. It was only in mode B. There was no power Doppler. Okay. I don't know what you would do then. <laughs> um I didn't choose to modify her treatment. She was already on adalimumab and methotrexate, and I felt that this synovite, this uh, enthesitis was not highly inflammatory. There was no power Doppler, and I told her to keep going on like that. Was I right about that, showing you again, comparing the GRAPA and the ULAR guidelines? Um, it depends. Do we consider this as active enthesitis? Then we might need to do more. I don't, I'm not sure this slide exactly applies to her because firstly, she's already treated. And secondly, again, there's no Doppler on her enthesitis and it was quite limited enthesitis. So anyway, but, um, yeah, so here we can see the differences between the recommendations in terms of, of the drugs. Again, the GRAPA is quite non-prescriptive, giving us a lot of choice. And the ULAR recommendations are more prescriptive, giving us, uh, pushing us more towards the biologics and less towards the targeted synthetic DMARDs in this case. Okay, so I didn't change her treatment. I did do some, you know, psychological support and told her to go and do physical therapy. 
But I did plan to see her again three months later, which I don't usually do. I see patients a bit more uh, spread out due to the, the time limitations for seeing me. Um, my consultation is free for everyone, and uh, um, I'm never late. So there are lots of people who want to come and see me. So anyway, uh, three months later, she did have persistent pain and fatigue. And actually, she's doing um, a bit worse in terms of fatigue now, and also in terms of the... Uh, the tender joints and the leads and the zitis. Um, and she has pain when I examine her, but no swelling, I have to say. Uh, and, um, yeah, so CRP is again negative. So, you know, she is not reaching the target. If we look here at DAPS and MDA, which I routine, routinely collect in my clinic, I find them easy to do. She has not reached a target of low disease for DAPSA nor for MDA. Um, so, you know, why is she not reaching it? If we look at these two scores in red or orange on the screen is what she is not reaching. She is definitely not reaching MDA because she really has both endesial pain, but also tender joint count. She's got uh, high patient global, high pain. And she's also not reaching DAPSA. Of course, it's a continuous score, but still, she's just too high on the tender joint count and the two patient reported outcomes, which are in there to allow her to, um, uh, to, to reach a target of low disease activity. And of course, she's not the only one. Isn't that such a pity for us and such a challenge when we're dealing with our patients that so many patients are not reaching the target? The target of MDA is only reached in around 36% of patients if you look across the literature. Um, and, and DAPSA, as we know, low disease is easier to reach around half of the patients, but she's, she's not reaching either of these. So, you know, that's an issue. Um, and of course, she's quite tired, so uh, that's quite frequent to be tired. Uh, and actually, I don't would not recommend to change the treatment based on fatigue because the efficacy of biologic DMARDs on fatigue in systematic literature reviews is only of a small effect size, small limit for moderate, which would correspond to an improvement at the group level of around 1.2 on a 0 to 10 scale. Uh, and that's at the group level. Of course, there's a lot of variation, but actually it's lifestyle changes which are most efficacious for fatigue. And then I think the burden is very wide, and in her case, I think the burden is indeed very wide. So she's not in low disease activity. She's got pain. She's got fatigue. She doesn't have signs of active inflammation. Would you still change the biologic? Would you modify the methotrexate co-medication? She's at a low dose methotrexate oral. Would you modify symptomatic treatment or would you check for comorbidities and confounding factors? Well, I think we would probably, I would hope all do D <laughs> in this case. I did ask her to fill in the fibromyalgia rapid screening tool. It's very easy. I have it in my clinic. It's available in many languages. And um, she did score, uh, she did score positive for the first, which I'm showing you here. It's, I think it's, I, it makes a lot of sense to our patients. I feel my patients like to fill this in. They feel that at last I'm taking care of them properly. Um, and in this case, the first questionnaire was positive, which, by the way, for a patient who only has a pain of five, would not always be the case. I think often those patients are at nine or ten of pain, or or they will say, I'm at 20 out of 10. I don't know if this happens to you as well. But she's actually reasonably low, I would say, on pain, but she is very tired and she was positive. So um, uh, widespread pain is, I think, a challenge for us in our clinics. It's quite frequent in PSA, and it's linked to worse outcomes. And as actually you showed us earlier, Shika, it's a lot more frequent in women. This is data from the PSABIO uh, study, but it, it is a lot more frequent in women with PSA. So her first questionnaire is positive. Basically, I did not change her treatment, and I discussed with her that pain is not always linked to inflammation, and I gave lots of lifestyle advice and sort of uh, psychological support. And I have to say, uh, I did see her recently and she gave me an advance uh, Christmas present. And actually she's so nice and patients are so nice, I think. And I get loads of Christmas presents and chocolates and wine because I'm in France and champagne. It's also Anyway, so the key messages from this case is I think that Enthesial pain is really challenging 
when should we be changing treatment and widespread pain, I think is clearly a difficult to manage situation in PSA. And it does make it difficult to apply the treat to target approach that we're told to apply. And I shared with you very frankly how difficult I find it to reach this target of remission or low disease activity in every patient. And what I really like to do, and I think it's, we're so lucky to be physicians in chronic diseases because discussing the, the, the key, you know, the treatment objectives and the target and what we're aiming for and what we're able to do, I think is the most fun in, in the clinic, at least for me. And thank you very much. And I'll pass it on to my co-speaker because we'll take questions for both of us at the end of this thank session. You. Um, those are very interesting cases, and I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Leanne Gensler, who is a professor of medicine and director of spondyloarthritis program at University of California, San Francisco. She, you know, she earned her medical degree from UC Irvine and then completed her residency at UCSF. She stayed there as chief resident, and now she is the fellowship director also there, and she is very internationally renowned for her work in axial spondyloarthritis, her work seemingly, seemingly <laughs> integrates cutting-edge <laughs> research with patient care and improving outcome for individuals with axial spondyloarthritis. Thank you, Marina, for that kind of introduction and to the organizers for inviting me uh, to share my challenging cases with you and Laura, amazing cases. And I'm glad you presented you know, a patient with, with comorbidities that often will drive symptoms of disease activity. Those are very challenging patients. I have them too. I'm not going to present that as a challenging case for you in axial spondyl arthritis today. So, so, you know, a challenge, these are really challenging cases for me. I think as, now I've taken care of these patients that I'm going to show you for the first patient 17 years through this, through this challenge is we learn so much from our patients. And so a lot of gratitude actually for them being able to continue to teach me. These are my disclosures. I will uh, talk a little bit about off-label use of therapies. Um, in fair balance, I think every drug class will be used today across two patients. Um, I usually, I'll never say brand names. I will usually, when I talk about drugs, use just the class. But in this case, because I'm using specific patient examples, I am going to use specific drug names, which is what I used in the case of these patients. So this is the first patient who, um, when he came to me with the 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 complicating issue. He was 36, but uh, with axial spinal arthritis, radiographic disease, and worsening back pain already on a biologic DMARD. The background for this patient was he actually presented at 10 years old um, with heel and knee pain and swelling. He was B27 positive. At 13, he developed hip pain, um, and he was diagnosed with juvenile spinal arthritis. Initially, at the time, he was treated with glucocorticoids, both oral and IV, methotrexate, alpha-salazine, because there were no biologics. And then in 2000, at the age of 17, he was started on etanercept. And you can see his x-ray here at 15 years old. He has, oops, back. He has, um, and I, I guess we, we can't point here, right? No, yeah. So I'll, I'll point to this side. You can see he's got virtually fused sacroiliac joints. Um, I can't fa <laughs> reach that side. The, uh, he has joints, the axial joints, he has narrowing of both hips, and then you can see this left hip here is quite severe at the age of 15. So um, this is actually an MRI that was done in 1999. It's poor quality, wide field of view, um, but what you can see very nicely is in the top window, you can see the bilateral sacroiliitis um, with bone marrow edema on both sides, and in the bottom view, you can see his hips with synovitis of the left hip, but you can also see really lovely anthocytis. You can see the greater trochanter lighting up. Um, and so he has both synovitis of the hip, sacroiliitis, and um, anthocytis. So that was the background. He then presented to me at 24. This is 2007. Um, no extramusculoskeletal manifestations at the time. And at the time, he was underdosing at self-tapered uh to, to 25 milligrams every two weeks. He had moderate disease activity, some functional impairment, and a high patient global, and just some left hip pain. But actually, his metrology was relatively normal. He had some mild elevated inflammatory markers. And so it was, this was not a challenge. In case it was easy, I said to him, go back to standard dosing, um, and, and he did. And, and at the time that I saw him, this is the 24-year-old x-ray, you can see now the 
sacral iliac joints are really fully fused, and that left hip um, is progressed. He actually now has AVN of the hip. So um, this is very typical of juvenile spondylarthritis, bad hip disease. And, and actually, I'm going to show you, this is his, his spinal x-rays at the time of presentation 24, really good. There isn't, and I think that just to remind you where the first place you can look for those syndesmophytes on an x-ray is going to be the lateral edges of the T12, L1 junction. That's the most common place we'll see syndesmophytes. And in this image, it's a little bit far away, but there is no syndesmophytes present. The neck is totally fine. And this is him at 24. And, and I think I felt like, well, and I, I don't usually show my own data, but this is my very first study I did as a fellow. <laughs> it is my fellow project where we showed that People that, that are adults that start their disease as kids before the age of 16, they have more hip disease, and we used a BASRI here, which is not even a measurement we use anymore, but this is a radiographic burden of damage in the hip and the spine, and kids that, adults that develop their disease as kids have more hip disease than people that develop it as adults, more need for hip replacement, but less spinal disease. And so I think, as I use this evidence, even in my own mind at the time in 2007, I thought, well, this fits the picture. He has bad hip disease, but he has no spinal disease, and hopefully we can continue this way. So now I'm going to show you the timeline. This is 2007 to the last time I saw him, which was last week. Um, <laughs> and on what you are looking at is actually his CRP So uh, over the years. So... This is when I first saw him in 2007. I increased his etanocept. And he, he actually had a couple of flares because of insurance issues and getting his drug delivered, unfortunately. But otherwise, I call these the golden years. I took it, you know, from 2007 until 2017. He did relatively well with minor flares along the way and relatively controlled CRP. And then he flared. And then he continued to flare. And of course, we, I say to my patients, just keep coming back to see me. And I, first do no harm, I will take care of you. Um, and you know, sometimes we do what we can, and I'm going to show you what happened to him. So first of all, this is his disease activity on top. Um, there's two measures that you're seeing, the bad dye, the colors. Um, my eyesight is terrible, but I don't know if you can, I can't see very well. What you can see is the bad dye and the ASDAS. The ASDAS is a better measure of disease activity, and you can see the sliding scale for the ASDAS on top. And so you can see inactive disease, low disease activity, and then high and very high disease activity. But interestingly, you can see that both the bad dye and the ASDAS really follow the same trend line. And what you're seeing over here is this is this big flare he had, where his disease activity, which was really low here, jumps up and then stays up for several years. On the bottom is his metrology. So starting at very normal metrology, what you see here is, first of all, this, is, uh, this line here is his lumbar lateral flexion, which starts out normal, and then over time starts to decline. And it's, a, it's over here now. It's still not normal. And then the other thing that goes abnormal is his occipital wall, which um, I'm not looking, seeing. I can't see. What is the occipital wall? is red. So you can see it starts off zero, and then it sort of climbs. And he is now at an occipital wall. And this is now, now he's 41 this year. And his occipital wall is eight centimeters. So he came to me normal. He came to me in a biologic, and he progressed. Um, Interestingly, the modified chub are not very helpful, by the way. If you're going to do a measurement to think about as a surrogate for damage, lateral flexion is much more sensitive, and that's the one that I would follow if you're thinking about lumbar spine. All right, so this is his spinal x-rays. Actually, I'm just showing you the AP window. And what you can see in 2009 and then in 2011 is he starts to actually develop ankylosis at that T12-L1 junction. So he does develop radiographic damage. Um, and then here's just a bigger window so that you can see that ankylosis at the lateral edges. Now in 2016, just before he really starts to flare. These are the x-rays in 2016, though, and they really don't look very bad. If you looked at these from far away, you'd say, I don't see a lot of damage. There's a little bit of squaring in the lumbar spine, but not a lot of damage. 
And this is his MRI at the time of that flare. Now, did I need to do an MRI? And I'm going to show you the guidelines. I didn't need to do an MRI because he had an elevation in his CRP. That had gone up. And I think in that setting, when you, you hear the right story and then you see the CRP go up, unless you have another explanation for the CRP, I don't need to confirm for myself that the patient has disease activity. I do li- I'm very data-driven, though, and so I like getting data when I, uh, when I can. And this MRI nicely shows... Um, facet synovitis, so inflammation here of the facet joint, that's T12, L1, sort of where those syndesmophytes were as well. So, so there's two sets of guidelines that we think about for axial spondyl arthritis. There's the ACR Spartan SAA guidelines. The last version of that was 2019. We are currently in a revision now. And then there's the ASIS ULAW guidelines, which came out in 2022. I'm going to use the ACR guideline flow sheet because I like it to sort of show my thinking as I thought about this patient. The major difference compared to the 2022 guidelines is that it really puts biologic DMARDs on an equal playing field in terms of you can choose either one in a patient that you're going to escalate from NSAIDs to biologic. You could choose a TNF inhibitor or an IL-17 inhibitor, whereas the ACR guidelines had TNF inhibitors above IL-17 inhibitors, mainly because at the time we had more experience with it and they weren't, thank you, and they weren't a lot of, um, is it jumping again? No, it's good. Okay, great. So these are the guidelines, and what you can see here is that now we are, have a patient that's on a TNF inhibitor who lost response. He was on that TNF inhibitor for more than a decade, 19, 2000, right? So this, we're in 2017 when he's flaring, 17 years, and he starts to flare. These guidelines suggested that if the patient had lost response to the biologic as an TNF inhibitor, you could consider going to another TNF inhibitor because there was evidence that people did respond to a second or third TNF inhibitor. And of course, this was done at a time where we didn't have other biologics, and, and so that's all the choice that there was. So based on that, I did put him on another TNF inhibitor. He had done so well for so long, and I put him on adalimumab. And he initially did a little bit better, and then he continued to have increased symptoms. And I was thinking, what now? And so this is sometimes when I have unclear disease activity, his CRP was elevated, but I'm like trying to prove to myself, did he really lose response from an immunogenicity standpoint? And sure enough, he had an anti-drug antibody with very, a very low trough. And so here now he had lost response to a second TNF inhibitor. And I thought to myself, okay, well, let's go back to the guidelines, which are going to kill me today. Um, <laughs> thank you. And what you can see here is, so what are other choices? And so I thought I, we had this shared decision-making discussion. I said, let's try a different mechanism. Let's put you on an IL-17 inhibitor. And I predicted he was going to do very well. He had a high CRP at the time. And so I switched him from adalimumab to sacrokinumab and look at his CRP. He just doesn't respond at all. And I'm just devastated now because, of course, he puts his confidence in me. This is a long-term relationship, and he is really flaring now. Oops. So at the peak of the CRP, I decide we're going back to a TNF inhibitor except this time we're going to use low-dose methotrexate to prevent anti-drug antibody development in theory. Um, and so I put him on second kidney map. And what I want to show you, first of all, is look at that drop in CRP. He just plummets. That's the load of the map. And then he jumps up a little bit again. And then we spend the next few years through the pandemic <laughs> Um, with moderate disease activity on these two drugs. But he feels better than he's felt in years, and he doesn't want me to change it. And so he has a hip replacement, a little bump in the CRP with a hold of his biologic, and then he comes all the way down. And so what happened here was I increased the dose of the sotalizumab. I went from 200 milligrams every two weeks to 200 milligrams every 10 days. He was sort of having symptoms come back before the two-week interval. And it's for the first time in years that his CRP was three last week when I saw him in clinic. Now, it could be an N of one, and next time I see him, maybe he'll be back up again. But I do this a lot in patients. We have limited tools in our toolbox for axial spondyl arthritis, and so one of the things I will try is if they are responding but not fully, is try to push the dose if the insurance will pay for it. It's variable, depends on the drug, depends on the payer, 
IV is easier to do that with than sub-Q, but I have been able to do it with sertralizumab in particular, and it's worked well for several patients. All right, so this is him, of course, just before his hip replacement, and I just want to highlight for you now he's ankylosed in the lower lumbar spine. You can see those syndesmophytes. All right, so uh, take-home points from this case. This is, was a patient with stable disease for years. It can become active and difficult to manage. Disease activity should be informed by objective data. I really like to use inflammatory markers, MRIs in this case, and antidrug antibodies when available. Juvenile spondyloarthritis can be aggressive in the spine. Patients can progress on biologic DMARDs. And consider low-dose methotrexate in patients who really prove that they generate antibodies against drugs. Um, on a TNF inhibitor in particular, I wouldn't necessarily say that with IL-17s. I don't think we have the same evidence. Um, and then consider dose escalation if you can, remembering that's off-label. All right, next case. The background on this patient, so this is a patient who will say is axial spinal arthritis with new back pain. So he actually presented at 54, not to me, with two years of back pain. He was misdiagnosed with mechanical back pain. His labs had elevated inflammatory markers, and an MRI of the lumbar spine showed spondylodiscitis. He had a positive PPD at the time from a TB endemic country, and so a vertebral biopsy was performed. He was started on four drug therapy for TB, but no growth happened, and then he was referred to rheumatology, where he was found to be HLA-B27 negative, no extra musculoskeletal manifestations, and the MRI showed chronic sacroiliitis without bone marrow edema when we evaluated him, but then the spondylodiscitis. And you can see this is the image of his, uh, it's actually a CT scan on the right, and then MRIs on the left, both fluid sensitive and, and fat sensitive. And the publication below was this case was so interesting, it got itself into the New England Journal of Medicine. And that's just part one. So these are inflammatory markers when he was first, when he first presented, you could see very high inflammatory markers. And then etanocept was started in 2016. And look at how he plummets everything and really goes into remission for nine months. And then nine months later, he presents with fever, oral ulcers, pulmonary nodules, and two weeks into his admission, he perforates his uh, small bowel, and he gets diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And so it's at this point, actually, that Henny J.M. publishes the case as a clinical problem solving, and his etanocept is changed to adalimumab. And for the next two years, he does well. And I'm not presenting to you a case that's published in the New England Journal of Medicine. There's a part two. So what happens on adalimumab? Well, he comes in with new back pain. And he has more, now he has CRPs elevated again. And the lumbar spine does not show any bone marrow edema suggestive of axial spondyloarthritis disease activity. An MRI also doesn't show Crohn's disease activity. MRE doesn't show Crohn's disease activity. However, it shows retroperitoneal enhancing soft tissue with diffusion with restricted diffusion and aortitis. Thoughts? And this was the back pain, because it had, it had infiltrated the paravertebral area. Biopsy showed B-cell lymphoma. I'm not kidding. Follicular low-grade, stopped the adalimumab, gave him rituximab, and put him on celecoxib for his axial spondylarthritis, and uh, he actually did well for a little while. But then his Crohn's flared, so vedolizumab, uh, actually vedolizumab was added together with rituximab. Um, he continued to have ileitis, and that was changed to ustekinumab. So now he's sort of slowly repopulating his B cells on ustekinumab and, and an NSAID, celecoxib, and he's doing okay. <laughs> and then he has new back pain. And so we're like doing this over again. PET scan does not show lymphoma recurrence. His MRI shows extensive spondylodiscitis that is suggestive of infection versus inflammation. So what do you do? This is a heavily immunosuppressed patient. What's your next step? Biopsy, thank you. <laughs> and so we did a CT-guided biopsy, which did not show any bacterial growth. Universal PCR was negative. Um, and so the diagnosis was actually axial spondylarthritis flare, on ustekinumab, not surprisingly, uh, celecoxib. His B cells are repopulated. What's your next step? I'll give you, so 
to, <laughs> in full um, uh, fairness, this was 2019 now. So we didn't have a lot of data on risk benefit of other mm -hmm. options. Mm -hmm. These are options we can think about. So this is my, um, you know, if you think about all drugs, uh, all diseases in the spectrum of spondyloarthritis, and then uh, all the drugs and drug classes we have, and this patient has axial spondyloarthritis and Crohn's disease, um, what are you going to give a patient that is going to cover both? And this patient is already on ustekinumab, and by the way, the gastroenterologist does not want to stop the ustekinumab for the Crohn's, which is now well controlled. So we have JAK inhibitors. I usually don't combine JAK inhibitors with other biologics, and I certainly don't give a lymphoma patient a JAK inhibitor. But it was before oral surveillance. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, we did. We gave him upadacitinib five years ago. This is 2019. And so we added that to ustekinumab plus his celecoxib, and everything has remained in remission for five years. That's his CRP. Now, his best eye is not normal. He has a lot of back pain from damage and other reasons. But his SDAS looks better than it has ever looked um, on this very strange combination, very much off-label. So the take-home points from this case is back pain in axial spondyloarthritis is not always axial spondyloarthritis, and sometimes it is. And the combination of biologic therapy can be, so I do, not uncommonly, I combine biologics. I will do an IL-23 with a TNF. I will do vetalizumab with a TNF. Often these are patients with, who have IBD that need this other mechanism, and the um, axial spinal arthritis needs a separate drug, and that's the one drug I'll comfortably use as a TNF inhibitor, even if it's not controlling the uh, IBD. Um, but so you can consider that. Again, think, remember that it's off-label. I would not recommend a biologic DMARD with a JAK inhibitor, despite this experience I'm sharing with you today. And I don't know that I would have done it had he presented to me after, after oral surveillance. Um, I think it's unclear what the risk of JAK inhibitors are in the setting of treated lymphoma, right? He had had rituximab, and that maybe that's part of why he's able to tolerate this. Um, but, I, but I think this is very much a data-free zone. That is, brings me to the end. Thank you. I'm happy to, to answer questions and really appreciate the amount that we learn from our patients, I think. Yeah. Uh, anybody has any questions about the cases or anything that would have been done differently by you guys? It's okay to share some. Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah, learning yeah. form. Nikhat from Pakistan, an excellent session. And you know, great learning. I would love to be your patient, Lori, the way your patients love you. I wanted to ask you that for the first uh, patient that you described with uh, psoriasis and oligoarticular arthritis, uh, wouldn't FDA mask be a better option in such a case? Thank you. Yes, I'm being asked if a premolast would be a good option for this patient, right? Um, I think there are two moments. The moment when I uh, start her treatment, and she, I start with methotrexate. This would be my usual um, recommendation, or at least for also it's about authorizations. For us in France, we, ha we are only allowed to give a premolast after uh, methotrexate. Um, I think it's the case in many countries, but not sure everywhere. And also, I just use more methotrexate in this indication. But I think then there's another moment when we could have asked ourselves is she has you know, uh, altered the radiographs of her wrist, and she was probably on methotrexate. So even though she doesn't have inflammation at that moment, can I consider it's a failure of methotrexate? The thing is, I think she did not take her methotrexate very well the first months. That's what I sort of understood from her. So that's why I didn't change. And if I had changed, I don't think I would have gone for a premolast because we don't have a lot of radiographic data with a premolast and what well, we don't have any. So, and with her, um, the re main point really is the radiographic progression because in terms of clinics, clinical symptoms, she's, she's not doing bad when I see her the second time. She's a bit painful on that wrist, but there's nothing else. But yeah, it, it, there are many options. I think if I had seen her, sometimes I would inject, it's a monoarticular, we yeah. inject the joint and then start methotrexate and often tell the patient that methotrexate may take some time to work. 
So this is going to give you some relief in the meantime. Yeah, absolutely. I gave her NSAIDs. She did not want a joint injection, actually. She just did not. She was okay to have subcute methotrexate, but she did not want to have a joint injection. I think she knew someone who had had it. It was painful or something. But I agree with you. It's a nice way to bridge over for efficacy. Hi, Matthew Stoll, UAB. Uh, Dr. Jensler, for your first patient who had a secondary loss of response after a good response to Tenercept for quite a few years, if this were today, would you try a different TNF inhibitor or would you go to a different mechanism? Yeah, that's a good question, Dr. Stoll. I think, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, he had rapid So he had. 17 years of response. I think I may have still stuck within the class. Now, he did not have uveitis history um, at the time of the switch or inflammatory bowel disease that required him to be on a TNF inhibitor. But I still don't think I would have jumped ship entirely after knowing that a he had responded to a mechanism previously. I, but, I, but I'm sure there are people that would. I don't know. What would you do? You know, uh, it was a very interesting and a very challenging case. Yeah. I learned from this meeting today, and actually was presented by Dr. Gossack's group about they looked at time to low disease activity and durability after a patient failed the uh, TNF inhibitor and axial spondyloarthritis. And what that abstract showed in this meeting was that once a patient has failed one or two TNF inhibitors, when you switch them. They have another biologic, IL-17, and actually it takes much longer time to get to the low disease activity, and the durability may not be there. Even if they get there, they come immediately lose that durability. So I think we have to let our patients know that those who have these complex, who have already been treated with two biologics, we may not get the good response as we were expecting what they had seen with their first biologic. These are very difficult, challenging cases. And also the flares, uh, there was another abstract presented in this meeting, and it was a meteor uh, database and they showed that the, they did use some machine utilization for looking at flares. They actually said patients who have been on a long duration on biologics are actually at risk of flare with low ASDAS. So that's exactly how this patient was. This had done, done very well on Embril for many, many years, was doing good and then suddenly flared. But I think but also I think when these patients, of course there are many treatment options and also we're going back in time so we didn't have yeah, exactly, exactly the same but some patients who do very well on the first TNF inhibitor, I feel they are very attached to the class and they, they are not very enthusiastic about changing treatment. So it's also a shared decision, isn't it? And yeah. it's not. Yeah. yeah, and I also, I think patients that flare on a biologic, I mean, it, yes, it's common, but that's, they've been on it a long time. Everyone has some risk of flare. Yeah. I think that's probably true that most people will have some amount a flare. But I think when patients start to flare on a biologic, often it's subtle. And the patient themselves, the, the, the anchor is their worst flare. And so they'll tolerate a little bit of a flare. And, and I think we just need to be very mindful about watching them, monitoring them very closely as you start to th see things tick up to make sure you don't lose full control, as, as I did, although I, I don't know that it would have been different if I had made a different decision from after the first lost response. I have uh, two questions for our speakers. Dr. Gensler, uh, thankfully your patient is still in remission from the lymphoma perspective. This is great. I thought you were going to say, thankfully, your patients still like you. <laughs> still like you, of course, <laughs> that's great. Um, do we have any data based on disease-specific JAK inhibitors and risk of malignancy based on the disease. Is it possible because if AXPA has less risk compared to rheumatoid that we're not seeing this? So we don't have um, JAK-specific data, right? All we have is the tofacitinib data right. um, but from a pure phase four, you know, 3B RCT. But I think, I do think the, the age in axial spondyl arthritis is Part of the story. I also, we know that rheumatoid arthritis patients have a twofold higher risk of lymphoma to begin with, so I think that's also part of it. Um, but this patient was older, right? He was 54 when he presented, when he was diagnosed. Um, and it's possible that he had many years of undiagnosed inflammation, which maybe he had a similar risk to an RA patient from that standpoint. Um, but I, I'm not comforted by the fact that axial spondyl arthritis patients compared to rheumatoid arthritis patients have less risk. 
And uh, Dr. Gosek, I have uh, a question for you. How often do you utilize MRIs for peripheral joints? So thankfully, you're at your center. You, they have access to ultrasound, which is not available everywhere. Yeah. So how often do you utilize MRIs for the wrist, for example? Well, for me, I rarely use MRI. I do see MRIs because some colleagues will send me over a patient with an MRI already performed. But because I have really experts in ultrasound in my center, uh, we use ultrasound. But I, like you, I like what you said, Leanne, about liking to have the evidence base. And I just feel before we switch treatments, and basically before we increase treatments, it's all about the benefit-risk balance as well for our patients, just individually not. I'm not, not talking about trials and, you know, beautiful meta-analyses and so on. I'm talking about a single patient here in front of you, and do you... Does it make sense to increase the treatment or switch the treatment for that patient? And that's why it was fun to prepare this session because we don't usually discuss this. This is more re real life, isn't it? So in my real life, I don't use MRI, but I would encourage people who don't have um, access to ultrasound, if you are not sure that the patient is getting worse or flaring, I, I think we need, to, we need to be sure of what we're doing. I think your first patient, your, the first ultrasound was negative. Yeah. And then six months later, developed uh, synovitis. Do you think an MRI might have picked up something that the ultrasound did not pick up? I do, you know. I feel quite bad for this patient. You know, as I said, it's, did I undertreat? I have to say, you know, it's the relationship as well. The way it works is, um, I, I just didn't think she had PSA. You know what I mean? Some patients, you see them and you, you just, just get this feeling they have PSA, and I, I thought she did not. She was very verbal about everything she had seen on the internet, and uh, it, and it, it was a very long consultation, which uh, and uh, I just didn't feel she had anything inflammatory. But indeed, maybe an MRI would have changed the position because we might see bone marrow edema, we might see other signs, and then I would have gotten more worried about her. Thank you, uh, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today uh, at the end of the ACR, and I wish all of you safe travels. <laughs>